Whoa, that's awesome. Are you guys seeing what I'm seeing? Yeah, she's flashing. Strobe lights. I'm about to have a seizure. Uh, yeah, I don't know what's going on there. Let's try that again. All right, that's a little better. All right, so here we are, uh, DCS Part C. This is the last ILM in the DCS section. And then we, uh, what do we get to do after that? Oh, a couple of small more units. Jeez, we're getting, we're getting uh, all educated here. So DCS Part C. Uh, a lot less intensive than yesterday's lecture. Today, we're basically talking about the uh, the ancillary uh, components of the GCS system, the, the stuff that kind of runs in the background that we don't think that much about. Um, so we talked about alarm management, history management. Uh, we'll look at security and access privileges again. Uh, redundancy as it applies to DCS, change management and audit trails as they relate to DCSs and safety considerations that we have to uh, pay attention to when we make changes online, uh, such as forcing and disabling and, and bypassing IO, uh, which I know that we've touched on uh, in a previous lecture. So this is should not be as hard on the brain as uh, all the information we had to take in yesterday. So our objectives for today here describe Describe, 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 alarm management, security and access, redundancy, change management, safety, uh, all good topics here. Okay, so we started with alarm management. And what alarm management really is, is a, a philosophy behind uh, how we make alarms, how we present alarms to the operators, and, and how we design the system so that it's easy to interpret uh, without becoming overwhelming visually uh, to look at uh, the operation screen. So uh, we don't often talk about the design of the HMI, uh, the, the operator stations and how they work. We, you know, we walk up to them and we can see different varieties of them that have maybe just data and other ones that have uh, substantial graphics attached to them. Um, but running in the background behind all of those operator screens is an alarm management system uh, that helps to uh, identify and uh, enunciate, I guess, alarms that are occurring within the plant. So designing the system um, and, and operating the system is something that falls under our uh, umbrella in terms of, of work. So we have to need, uh, we're going to need a relatively uh, good understanding of of what happens uh, with alarms, aside from the fact that you know they just they just happen and there's lights and and horns and things that that go along with them. So we have a little chart over here that tells us kind of the different levels of of operating states uh, that a process could be in at any at any given time. And we use this diagram here to uh, kind of identify at, at what points we have to do something to encourage uh, operator intervention uh, and you'll see the arrow here on the left hand side that says that as as we move up uh, this table here operator intervention becomes more and more critical so we look at the four different uh, operating areas as illustrated here we have a target operating area uh, down at the bottom which is of course optimal uh, just above off uh, target we have normal which is where we are operating probably most uh, most of the time, somewhere somewhere in this area, if we're if we're lucky, uh, things start going south a little bit. We get into abnormal conditions, upsets, uh, off quality product, emissions, and things like that are are starting to be affected. And then finally, at the top level here, we have shutdown situations where we could have automatic or manual shutdowns. Uh, we could have flaring, product dumping, things of that nature. So increasing in severity as we as we go up in these operating conditions. So we, we need the operators to be able to respond to these things. When we're in the target area, in the normal area, there's really no issues. Um, but as we get into these other conditions here, we have to have some way of identifying them and alerting the operations uh, people to the conditions that are occurring. So 
we put in alarms. That's part of part of our job here. So we'll see uh, different types of alarms that we can we can put in here. It's not all uh, you know hell is coming and fire and brimstone and all that kind of stuff. If it's designed properly, um, we can use the alarm system as a good tool to um, help facilitate management of of alarms. So between target and normal, we'll have uh, an indication possibly of uh, off target indication telling us that things aren't exactly the way we want them to be, but they're, they're not really bad. Moving up, we get a pre-upset warning. Uh, as we move out of the normal condition into abnormal, there is an upset indication. Uh, and moving up in the abnormal area, we get to a pre-trip area. And then of course, the most uh, vital one here is a, is a trip, which we want to try to avoid at, at all costs. Um, you're not going to see an, an alarm for every one of these conditions in every uh, operating station, but these are some of the things that are considered when the alarm philosophy is designed. So when they design an alarm uh, system, they, they do it with something called a, an alarm life cycle. And this is a, an image that represents the alarm life cycle that shows the stages that need to be performed when an alarm system is developed or an alarm management system is developed. So it starts out with, you know, thinking about it. What are, what do we want to do? What are the safety concerns that we're worried about? What conditions uh, will cause us uh, issues? You know, just the thoughts of behind what our alarm system is, is supposed to do. Then we move through different steps, identification of hazards, rationalization, meaning if this happens, what happens? Uh, detailed design goes, okay, well, this is, these are the potential conditions that we have. Uh, what provisions are we going to put into our alarm system in order to uh, be able to manage these uh, abnormal conditions? And then it gets into implementation. So we think about it for a while, then we, we design the system, and then we get into the operation and maintenance of it. So this is the, all this stuff kind of happens before everything is implemented, and then this stuff is happening as the plant is operating in a, in a day to day type of situation. So the operation, the operators use the HMIs to monitor and control the process, uh, maintenance of the HMI and the different equipment uh, tied in with alarms. And we're always looking at monitoring and assessing it. We'll, we'll have counters that, you know, how many alarms do we get in a day? Are they the same alarms all the time? Uh, and we can use this data to uh, adjust the process and make adjustments physically and in the control scheme in order to try to uh, get rid of uh, alarms that are uh, too too prevalent that happen too that happen too often um, and then this feeds back into what we call a management of change process which means that we've designed it we thought about it we put it into practice and we're using it every day as we move forward day by day we learn things uh, that work well and we learn things that don't work well and the things that don't work well we move back into the, the MOC or the management of change area where we can reassess them make alterations to our, our plan and our design and bring them back into the system and again try to become better and better all the time. Uh, over here on the right hand side we have an audit process um, which is exactly what you'd probably imagine it is. It's a, it's a kind of a step back and look at the whole system and see how well is this functioning, how much time is it taking, is it uh, is it is it a benefit to us or is it a burden to us? And and that's really one of the things that you have to uh, think about when you're designing an alarm system is you want it to provide all the pertinent alarms that are necessary to keep the plant running properly, efficiently, proper quality, etc. But you don't want to make it so that it's so uh, overwhelming and, and busy that the operators uh, are always trying to chase something. <clears throat> okay, so just going through the steps uh, in ILM terms here, the philosophy document is the document uh, that sets out the objectives of the system design and the procedures that are put in place to meet the objectives. Then we go into the identification stage, which is used to highlight the issues and desi desired actions. The rationalization stage, classifies identified potential alarms to determine the alarm type required, whether it's a warning alarm or a, a triple code red or whatever it is. Um, there's different categories of alarms that we will uh, look at as we move uh, forward and some of them are listed here. So uh, a basic alarm here says no, uh, or sorry, an alarm 
generally means that some type of operator intervention is required. We have an alert, which is a little bit uh, less significant, where no operator action is required. It's just uh, something to notify you that something isn't quite exactly right, but you don't have to panic at this point in time. Uh, below that, there's a prompt. Uh, it needs a little bit of operator action. And then there's uh, other types of alarms that are just messages that, all, that may just give you some type of information. And you'll see in the modern uh, DCS systems, um, there's a lot of information that we can attach to any of these uh, statuses or alarm classifications here uh, in terms of uh, actually giving directions to the operators as to how to respond to particular events. Okay, uh, alarm levels are uh, covered under ASA standard 18.2. Um, and it recommends three or four alarm levels. And uh, usually it's these three. So emergency level alarms, which are the highest level and should be a min or a, 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 at most three to 5% of all your alarms. And ideally you probably don't want any of these, but in the worst case scenario, three to 5% of alarms. High level alarms, these warn of potential emergency situations if not dealt with quickly and should be less than 30% of alarms. And then low level alarms indicate the process is moving from normal to abnormal and require some operator action. And these are generally the bulk uh, of alarms. Uh, and some of these sound like, you know, kind of large numbers, but we're not talking about 30% uh, in a day or 5% in a day. Uh, we're talking overall, uh, if we were to do an audit, an annual audit, and we looked at all the different levels. Uh, of alarms that we've received over the duration of a year. These are kind of the ranges that we're, that we're looking at here. Um, general rule, as the consequences or the severity of the alarm increases, the reaction time decreases. So an emergency level of alarm, uh, obviously you're gonna have to get off your chair and run out there pretty darn quick. Uh, a low level alarm, you know, you don't have to respond quite as quickly. The detailed design stage here is DCS specific, so it includes how you will design the basic system, uh, which includes triggering and state, so what, what items are going to cause alarms. Uh, it also includes the HMI component, so uh, how do we notify the operators, how do, we record the, how do we record the history, how do we manage all the data that's being brought in uh, from, the, from the alarms, uh, and that involves moving the, that information uh, from the process um, from the process area into the uh, alarm and data historian areas, which we will talk about later. And we mentioned the data, uh, data acquisition servers that are responsible for historical data and alarm data being separate servers typically in a, in a DCS system. Okay, different alarm states here clipped out of the ILM. You can see there's uh, different alarm states. So normal, unacknowledged, acknowledged, returned to normal, unacknowledged, shelved, uh, suppressed by design, out of service, different levels um, of alarms. And we've seen some of these terms before, normal, unacknowledged, and acknowledged. Uh, we've probably seen some of these. Some of these terms may be new. So return to normal, unacknowledged means that it or the process went into a, an alarm state, a high level, for example, but then it came, then it came back down and it cleared itself. Uh, shelved, which is a new one, uh, the operator temporarily suppresses the alarm. Uh, and this is, of course, somewhat dangerous. Uh, and as a result, you want to make sure that this is documented. Um, it's not a process that you probably want to get into. Uh, and then suppressed by design, auto service are somewhat relatively uh, self-explanatory. Okay, so when we talk about alarms, you think about uh, the severity of the different alarms, but there's also uh, a whole uh, theory section on what types of alarms do we do we want? How do how do we how do we quantify or qualify the different types of alarms? So is it a, a high alarm or a low alarm? Um, and those are kind of what we call absolute alarms. They get to a certain point and we're expecting some type of a response. There are also other in types of alarms such as deviation alarms. So uh, if I'm you know, plus or minus 5% of set point, 
Uh, if I get over that, maybe I want alarms. We call that a deviation alarm, a rate of change alarms, uh, meaning that the process changes at a, uh, a rate that's too fast for our liking, so X percent per minute, that type of thing. Uh, controller output alarms, system diagnostic alarms, instrument diagnostic alarms, calculated alarms. So there's a number of different types of alarms. It's easy to get wrapped up in, in making an alarm uh, for all kinds of things, but you have to be careful not to have too many alarms because the operator's job is to operate, not to uh, always respond to alarms, hopefully. So that's part of the design process. And if the process is designed properly, you shouldn't have those problems. Um, but at the same time, when you're designing the HMI, you don't want to overload things. Uh, certain alarms can cause nuisance alarms, and this is one of the things we're trying to avoid, that can enunciate excessively or unnecessarily or do not return to normal when acknowledged. So chatter, you know, things like that, uh, pressure switch chatter, level switch chatter, things like that, alarms that come in and out and in and out. We don't want that. And there's things that we can do as control technicians to alleviate that. We can put filtering on the signal, uh, timers on the signal, uh, things like that, so that we can try to alleviate these nuisance type alarms. Okay, uh, different type of alarm attributes. So we can have alarms uh, based on set points or trip points, uh, dead bands, on delays, uh, off delays, different things that we can do when we're configuring uh, the alarm in order to try to uh, make it more specific and less general so that we see it less often and it comes up only uh, on situations that we actually want it uh, want it to, to come in. Okay, the HMI uh, is, is a big part and I wish uh, we did a little bit more on this, but um, again, it's one of these uh, skill sets that's part of our trade that is really, it's a course in of itself. Um, so we get a good general understanding, hopefully here to uh, see how it goes in, but we don't get into the dirty details of it. Um, the HMI component allows the operator to be notified of the alarms and their severity and to be able to acknowledge them. And again, we fall under that ISA 18.2 guidelines, and it kind of tells us the things that we should be designing into our HMI system for the different types of alarms in terms of do we need uh, an audible indication uh, and what do we need in terms of visual indication. So we could have, uh, you know, a process variable changing from green to yellow or green to yellow to red or we could have an exclamation point, or it could flash, uh, all different things that could be configured into the HMI, depending on the, on the type uh, of alarm uh, that we get here. And again, this is kind of an ASA, or sorry, an ISA standard. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so the HMI design must be able to inform the operator of what is happening, and if possible, what to do. And this is really an interesting uh, addition to, to uh, older control systems uh, that DCS has kind of picked up on. And it, it provides a lot of different information in, uh, that the operator can use. So we'll look at uh, what that means here in the next slide. So how does the operator get information from alarm? Um, it's something that the DCS software package contains and it's called information linking. And what information linking does is if an alarm does happen, a pop-up uh, window like you'll see here on the screen, uh, it, can be, it can be programmed into the system to pop up and it'll give all kinds of interesting information uh, to the operator. Uh, it includes things like the recommended action, what happens if you don't get off your chair and go do it, tell you possibly what caused the incident and tells you how much time you have to respond and then some design information. So what the philosophy was behind in the uh, alarm in the first place. So I know the graphic here is a little bit small. Pretty sure that this is clipped out of the ILM. Let me just look here. It is. So you can see there it's a very, very helpful tool here. Uh, you see time to respond. Uh, you got less than 30 seconds. Uh, 
consequence of inaction, major economic input, $100,000 to uh, $500,000 potential loss, blah, blah, blah. So this information linking that's tied to the alarms is a very useful tool uh, that the software packages of some DCS uh, systems will provide us. Other advanced alarming capabilities, uh, logic-based alarming. So it uses logic to filter alarms to avoid flooding. And flooding is a term uh, that is used to describe uh, an excess amount of alarms that are coming into a system at any given time. So for example, if you had uh, one major piece of equipment that if it tripped, it's gonna start making everything else that it that is tied to it also go into alarm. Uh, then the alarm screen, the operator screen is gonna light up. There's gonna be horns and bells and whistles and flashing lights everywhere. And the operator is likely to not even know where to even start. And that's called flooding. So if we're aware that something like that can occur, we can put it in the logic to say, okay, well, if we lose this, we know for a fact that we're gonna lose all these other things and we're gonna get all these other transmitter alarms and you know different types of alarms. So we can program that and say, okay, well, if we lose this, we're no, we're gonna, we know we're gonna lose all that stuff. So let's just make it so that the alarms don't come in. And that's kind of the way to get around flooding uh, using logic. State-based alarming uh, requires certain conditions or states. And I'll be with you in a second, Michael. And then model-based uh, alarming is something that's a little more complex. And these are just uh, other advanced alarming mechanisms that are kind of mentioned in the end of the section here. Go ahead, Michael. Well, you mentioned those uh, alarm flooding. Are those alarm flooding uh, critical alarms or just nuisance alarms? Alarm flooding, as I understand it, is usually a result of some type of a major upset that brings down large portions of a facility and as you bring down large portions of a facility all of the individual components will also start to alarm at the same time so it's it's more of a, a result of something major failing and then all the ancillary components that support that that uh, mechanical device going along with it. So it'd be like, it would be like losing, uh, it'd be like losing flame to your furnace, for example. Uh, then you'd start getting a temperature alarm, then you'd start getting a flow alarm, then you'd start getting pressure alarms, uh, and all those kind of things. So it's, it's kind of a, an association kind of uh, effect. Does, it, does that answer your question? So if you filtered those uh, critical alarms, such as your furnace, uh, shut down with this uh, to cause any issues for the operators. Well, it's all part. It's it's part of the design, right? So you you can design a plant, and and if you know your piece of equipment well enough, and and you and uh, you, you document it well enough, and you go through design phase properly, you can say you can you can plan for it, right? You can say, okay, well, if I know if I lose my flame, for example, what's that going to give me? Well, it's going to give me a probably a loss of flame alarm, first of all. And then all the other things that happen as a domino effect as a result of as a result of that. So if you if you know logically what's going to happen as a result of one thing failing and the domino effect that was is going to follow it, you can plan it logically to uh, to ignore all those alarms and it'd just be like one major alarm instead of 30 small alarms that are all associated with the same equipment. Does that help? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, still in the design uh, conversation here. The system uh, is commissioned in the implementation stage. Uh, that includes planning, training, testing, validation, and documentation. So this is something that we kind of call, uh, you could almost call it commissioning, I guess, if you wanted to. Uh, they're, they're calling it commissioned uh, implementation. Same thing. Um, planning typically done, but training the operators, 
uh, making them understand how the, how the system works, what to look for, testing all the alarms, validating the alarms and documentation. These are the activities that are covered in the implementation stage. Operational stage, uh, getting towards day-to-day -day activity here includes refresher training uh, and alarm shelving training. So this is more operator specific, um, but as, as control technicians, we should obviously understand the whole, the whole deal, the big picture. Um, shelving, again, we've mentioned earlier, typically allows the operator to ignore an alarm for the duration of a shift. And I'd, I'd never heard of this term uh, previously. Uh, you know, we've heard of uh, operator, you know, putting it in bypass or putting it in manual uh, or things like that. Um, but shelving is another, another activity, I guess, that you can kind of put in that category. Um, not common practice, not something that you want to do on a regular basis, but it is something uh, that can be done. Uh, for example, you have a, a nuisance device, something you know that's, that needs some work, but there's no instrument guys to fix it today. Uh, so rather than have to acknowledge an alarm every 20 minutes, you shelve it for the day. Uh, again, you got to be careful when you do this. Um, it's not something that most facilities will let you do probably uh, and if you do do it it has to be documented properly and we'll talk about that i believe a little bit later uh, when we get into uh, documentation and, and change management okay maintenance stage uh, consists of testing and if necessary replacement and repairs this is kind of where we fall in uh, must take these following steps or basic steps when we go to take care or maintain uh, anything that is in the alarm system here so uh, take it in and out of service, notify operations of the out of service condition and implementing uh, a backup alarm system if required. And then documenting uh, the authorization. So the permit that you pulled from the operations so you go out and do your work. Uh, that contains usually all of this information. Who's, who's doing the work, when you're doing the work, uh, what you did and, and your success level. So this is all handled. This is really uh, kind of where we come in mostly is in this stage here, the maintenance stage. Last stages, monitoring assessment. Uh, this is where we monitor uh, the performance and report on the, on the performance here. So you can see uh, the different metrics that they, that they use to, to measure. And I believe this is all based off at ISA 18.2 as well. Uh, so monitoring and assessment, management of change, uh, which handles any changes that have been made. So this includes the documentation so that when people look at the process uh, that it matches the, the philosophy as, as they understand it. Uh, you don't want to change the philosophy uh, for yourself and not let everybody else know about it. And then the audit process uh, is part of the improvement process. So if we have made changes, um, we will work that into the audit, audit process here. So different um, metrics here. So. Uh, enunciated alarms per day per operating position, alarms per hour, alarms per 10 minutes, percentage of hours containing more than 30 alarms, all these different uh, performance metrics that, that are used when we uh, are doing a, a monitoring and assessment and an auditing practice on, on our alarm uh, systems here. And you know, some of these numbers are, you know, you kind of find find alarming like for me here enunciated alarms per day per operating position so let's say you got four operators on a on a shift this is saying that we could have uh less than 150 per person so <laughs> they're saying uh, we can press the acknowledge button 600 times in a shift and that's a measurement of success and uh, i don't know if that's maybe i'm missing something here but that seems a little bit odd to me <laughs> At any rate, there are metrics that you have to establish and define uh, so that you got consider, uh, consistent assessment methods. <clears throat> All right, so moving uh, from the philosophy model and how we designed it in the different stages into how do we manage uh, all the information that's get, getting created by our control system. Uh, we learned uh, in industrial networks that the system is uh, a bunch of different types of systems that are generally uh, all sharing data, uh, picking up data uh, from the process, sending that data to a server somewhere, 
where it's a warehouse that every every other little workstation, whether it's uh, the enterprise level, the operation level, the uh, controller level, can go in there and can kind of grab that information. So that falls under the the umbrella of the the, the data acquisition system or the alarm historian uh, or the historian historian. And this is the section that we talk about starting here on about page 14. Uh, history management is the collection, storage, and maintenance of process data. Uh, uses a database called the historical database or database historian. And the data that we collect here includes real-time data, which is the current process measurements, historical data, which is measurements that have uh, passed already, uh, event data, which includes alarms and changes, and configuration data, which is all the configuration change information. So we're working on one of our operator stations where uh, it's actively collecting what's going on in our controllers every second of every day. Uh, it's displaying it for the operators to see uh, real-time numbers. It's also storing those numbers in the historian servers so that we can uh, pull them out historically and use them for the business guys or the guy off site or whatever it happens to be. Anytime we make a change in here, it's picked up and it's recorded. So the history management is all um, built into our distributed network. That's it on that sub uh, subject. We've talked about this uh, in, a, in a different class. So I, I hope we have a good general understanding of how that uh, real-time data, historical data, event data, all that stuff gets stored on our uh, servers. Okay, objective two in the ILM here is security and access. So we'll get a little bit deeper into security and access for a DCS. And again, uh, very Windows-based and should be very familiar to most of us because it is not dissimilar uh, from Windows and how do you allow access onto your computer, uh, whether it's your personal computer at home or whether it's at work. Most of the time uh, we have to log in. Uh, certainly at work we have to log in. You might not have, might not have to at home, um, but if you have teenagers like I do and you have the best computer in the house and your 15 year old wants to get on and play games, uh, I don't like that, so I want to make a list of who can log into my computer. I want to make a list of who's able to download things onto my computer. Uh, that type of thing is handled by security and access that we're going to look at now. <sighs> all right, so security. Here's all the different potential threats that we could have if we have a, a network system with a bunch of computers on it. Um, not going to get into it super duper deep, deeply here, um, but some of the things that we are concerned about, remote login, I know Michael asked a question about this the other day, well, how do you, how do you keep people from the outside logging into your, your network, especially if it's a wireless network, because a wireless network, of course, can be broken into without anybody really knowing about it, whereas a wired network, uh, there were, you have to physically tie into it, uh, kind of like the bomb, uh, the bomb guys that you see on TV, you know, you got to cut the blue wire or whatever it is that you got to do, but uh, that's a risk. Application backdoors, so uh, I'm not going to read all of these things for you here, but backdoor is obviously a different way that someone can get into your system uh, that you're not aware of. Denial of service uh, has to do with uh, people trying to log on to your system uh, in mass numbers that prevent actual people that need to log on to the system the opportunity to get in there. Uh, macros, viruses, getting a little bit deeper into the uh, programs that can mess up your system. Source routing, boot sequence, all of these are potential threats to our, our network and our system. Okay, to mitigate risk to that security, we can implement certain security measures. Uh, first and foremost are firewalls. These are controls that, uh, that monitor the network traffic and ask, act as a barrier to outside networks. And we have these uh, at work, at home, and industrially. 
uh, access privileges. So this is the uh, classification of usernames and passwords and the assignment of uh, access to certain levels uh, of, your, of your system. And lastly, here we have workspace environmental security. So what can be done on a workstation? Uh, this limits the ability, for example, to use uh, a USB thumb drive in your operator station or to sit on your operator station and uh, watch Netflix or surf porn or whatever it is that you want to do. So you can uh, you can say, OK, well, on the on the your office workstation, you can do whatever you want. You can go on Facebook and you can surf all kinds of stuff. But on the operator workstation, none of that can happen because you obviously don't want to make yourself susceptible to, to viruses and things like that that you can get when you're uh, surfing in places that you maybe shouldn't be surfing. Okay, access privileges. This is where we uh, break our network into uh, security levels and assign uh, access privileges based on this level. So who can get in, who can do what uh, falls under access privileges here. So the user manager is a software component uh, that controls this. Uh, it controls the access to different programs and it's provided, uh, it provides different user accounts, groups, and certain locks or keys. And it's very, very similar again to how Windows uh, operates. So long story short here, it, it classifies every individual into a category. And within that court category, you're only allowed access to certain things. Uh, at the top here, we have the administrator. So he can get in there and he can do pretty much everything at, at the administrator level. Uh, operators, of course, we don't want them changing programming or configurations or anything like that. So we limit them. Um, same idea with uh, configure, maintainer, uh, SIS configure. So these are all different levels uh, of the software program that we want to limit so that some people can't get into. So SIS or safety instrument instrumented systems here, these are very critical. So out of you know the 10 instrument guys that are in the department, there maybe is one that can get into this level. Uh, maintainer, out of the 10, maybe all 10 can get into here. Uh, out of the configure section here, out of a department of 10 instrument guys, maybe half of them you know, have the Delta V training, for example, to, to go in there and uh, knowledgeably modify things. So half of the crew can get into configure. Um, operator, again, you want all your operators to have access, but only to certain things. You don't want them to be able to get into probably any of these things uh, that the control techs can get into. So this is how we, this is how we control who can do what. Okay, so here's another table uh, basically showing you who can do what. Uh, groups, operator groups, uh, technician groups, guest groups, things like that. Um, locks and keys, we don't mention very often, um, but these are access for specific tasks. And I've never, I've never seen one of these act actually in place. Uh, most of the time access is, is handled through uh, either your, your, your group basically is where your access is normally handled. Okay. So, uh, I'm not going to get into the details, uh, of what happens here, but this is a good kind of table, uh, for me to ask you a bunch of different multiple choice questions. So, uh, if I said in terms of access privileges, uh, which group, uh, you know, doesn't have access to, uh, configuring or which group does have access to configuring configuring but it's pretty it's pretty self uh, self-explanatory right you got a guest comes on site you don't want them to be able to configure uh, or or do any modifications so you know it's it's relatively logical okay uh, that's access privileges um, moving on to objective three here redundancy not a lot of things to look at here in terms of redundancy. We spoke about this before in industrial networks. Um, redundancy is almost always there, unless of course you have a very, very small facility. Uh, but any place that's in operation to make money, 
most likely is going to have uh, some level of redundancy and we'll address a couple of levels of redundancy in this next objective here okay why do we need redundancy according to the ilm three reasons uh, first is safety critical processes where failure would be very bad uh, in terms of safety so explosions uh, environmental loss of life and equipment things of that nature second reason uh, for redundancy is uh, we always have HMIs available for operator access to control the process. Uh, we want to be able to cover our behinds if we lose uh, one of our controllers or one of our servers or something like that. We suddenly have no control anymore. The buttons and screens that the operators use mean absolutely nothing and you can't react to anything unless you're outside in the field physically doing it. So that of course brings along with it certain dangers and, and uh, issues. So uh, having a redundant HMI in place. So if one goes down, we still have some method of uh, reaction important. And listed at number three, um, but probably closer to number one than we think, is preventing costly downtime, right? Redundancy is there so that we don't have downtime. So how do we define uh, different levels of redundancy? And we talk about uh, three that are identified in the ILM here uh, in terms of availability and redundancy. So uh, the first one is, is basic availability. Uh, and there'll be little write-ups. Let me turn to that page, page 23. Little write-ups that describe uh, how they uh, how they handle the redundancy and, and uh, what we have left over if something were to fail. So uh, they're classified as basic, high, and fault tolerant. And I don't think, oh, I do. Okay, good. So I threw a couple of graphics in here really quickly here. So uh, I don't have a diagram here for basic, but basic, uh, we'll move from there to high. Uh, high availability, so high availability, as you see here, uh, two network cards, two CPUs, uh, redundant communication ports, so a little bit of redundant equipment here. Moving to the next level up for fault tolerant, which would be the, the biggest, baddest, bestest. Here you'll see we have two CPUs just like we had over here. We have two network cards just like we had over here. We have two redundant communication ports just like we had over here. Two network uh, access cards as we have over here. But now we also have redundant IO, which means that just about anything uh, can fail in a fault tolerant system. Half, I mean, half of it uh, can fail any individual component can fail and we still have another one to pick up with. Uh, whereas on a high tolerant uh, system, we don't have quite as much. So this is how they qualify them. So basic DCS must be shut down to fix it if a fault occurs and you don't see this very often. High availability uh, has sufficient redundancy to carry on if a fault occurs somewhere. Most DS DCSs are like this and it has redundant everything except for IO. So if we lost anything from the controller level up, we're still good because we got doubles of everything. It basically just means if we lose a, a device, a, a transmitter, a final control element, something like that, we'd have to, we'd be kind of screwed on that data point. It's not critical because it's not gonna bring down the whole system, but it is a bit of an issue. Uh, fault tolerant, uh, biggest, bestest, baddest here, prevents critical processes from going down, has all the same stuff as high avail availability with the addition of redundant critical I.O. And the key term here is critical I.O. You're not going to have to put redundant I.O. on absolutely everything. You can, if you got the money, go ahead. Um, but definitely redundant I.O. on all the things that are critical. Objective four, change management. So this is the process that's put in place uh, to document and record any changes uh, that we make to a distributed control system 
whether it's a change in range, uh, change in operating conditions, change in the program, uh, change in the alarms, alarm levels, alarm severity, excuse me, colors of graphics, et cetera, et cetera, any changes uh, that we make to a DCS. And they call that uh, management of change, or MOC is a common term that you may hear in industry. So why do we have it? Well, of course, changes are uh, happen. Uh, improvements are made and modifications are made, new equipment's brought in. Uh, so we have to make changes. Um, we often make changes while the system is running. So we have to have a procedure in place so that we can avoid shutdowns or catastrophic events while we make changes. Some of the reasons uh, for change that I mentioned here already, uh, process modifications, uh, optimization, plant expansion, enhanced safety, or uh, new regulatory or environmental uh, requirements may uh, be cause for us to make some kind of a change. A management of change system uh, software package is uh, part and parcel of most DCS uh, software packages and it's added to the DCS database. Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> the reason we have uh, management of change process and package is so that we can track the changes. We can display version differences so we can look at the old one side by side with the new one and, and we can say, okay, here's what we have today. Uh, what did it used to be? Has anything been changed? And it'll give us uh, you know, give us a point of reference. Say, oh, well, here's here's the problem. Uh, Ray came in yesterday on a Monday after the Super Bowl, and he changed this alarm point to be 10 degrees higher because he didn't want to answer it every uh, two hours. Uh, that's a problem, so we we'll have to change that back, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that's kind of kind of the definition of uh, a rollback. So someone made a change that didn't work. I have historically saved the change that I made previously in my in my change database, so I can go back to the way it used to be. Uh, I can create management reports, and this is a dangerous one. Um, this can show you uh, who made a change when. It can tell you when an operator made a set point change, when the operator acknowledged an alarm, all that kind of stuff. So nothing uh, that happens in the control system goes unnoticed by the control system. All that information is caught and recorded in our historian uh, database. Uh, control, uh, conducting SIS module tracking. In SIS, we haven't talked about uh, at all, but it's a safety instrument system. And basically it's an additional, uh, it's a complete additional hardware package that's added onto a control system that is there to um, <clears throat> monitor and control a very, very essential uh, components within within our process. And we'll talk about SIS. Uh, it's one of the last ILMs that we talk about. Uh, management of change. You're still archiving uh, old database versions and, and graphics. So anything, everything that happens in the control system is captured uh, as part of the change management process, provided that um, it has access to that data. So if it's part of the control system, uh, it's automatically there. The data is getting put into the uh, into the historian servers and the server is storing it. Um, if it's process data that an operator inputs or something that we've changed in terms of configuration, it captures that as well. Wow, that was, uh, that was dirty and quick, but I, I hope you understand that. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Why do we need a change management process? Uh, it's really it's really about covering our bottoms uh, and understanding what has happened and why uh, people have made changes so that uh, we can we can use that data should a, should a problem arise. Objective five, change safety. So this is zooming in uh, a little bit. We've kind of been talking about the bigger picture, stepping back, looking at why we why we have alarms, why we have historians, why we have change management, all this kind of stuff. Here we're going to get back to drilling down uh, to programming and change safety when it comes to uh, programming and operating the DCS program itself. So uh, specifically talking to online changes 
uh, while our process is, is running. And it's always a slippery slope and an always a dangerous slope. Um, so always uh, use, of course, extreme caution when editing online. Uh, any mistakes that you make can injure workers and damage equipment in an operating plant. And it's something that we kind of don't focus on a lot in the lab because there are no real consequences uh, in the lab. Um, but it is something that in real life you have to certainly play, pay attention to. And I, I hope as uh, control technicians, even when you're um, big bad journeyman, uh, you have to be fully aware of what you're doing before you make changes out there, uh, your job, uh, as well as the lives uh, and safety of equipment and other things are, are relying on your, uh, your wisdom here. So before you do any editing online, make sure that you assess all possible scenarios as to how the process can react to those changes. Make sure you notify all the personnel, pull your permits, uh, get everything uh, switched over that needs to be switched over from auto to manual so that you don't make anything move out in the field that you don't want moving, that nobody's expecting. Um, and uh, third, uh, but not third in importance, uh, we've mentioned this previously here, upload and save the current configuration as a backup. First and foremost, anytime Anytime you sit down at a workstation, uh, Delta V, Logix 5000, whatever it is, someone asks you to look at it, why isn't this working? Make sure you have a backup before you do any changes. Uh, I'm not saying that you have to uh, back it up if you're going in to just look at some stuff, but if you're going to change anything, make sure before you do that you upload and save it because if things go bad, and they frequently do, very nice and easy to just go back to your previous version, download it back to the controller and you're back where you were at the start of the shift, call in somebody smarter uh, to pick up where you left off. Okay, so what are the things that we can do that we need to be worried about? Uh, forcing is the first one. And what forcing is, is a little button uh, in the uh, workstation software that allows you to override a tag value. Uh, it's dangerous and it's also helpful. Uh, we can use it to test and debug our logic, uh, check wiring, or temporarily keep our process running when an input device has failed and is being repaired. So uh, this is something that we can do within the software, uh, the logic, in order to keep ourselves running if an end device out in the, in, out in the field has, has failed. Uh, the limit switch uh, is no longer working as, as it's supposed to, so the logic in our software is not changing the way it's supposed to, and that may trip something and, and shut down a unit. So in order for us to be able to continue to run, we can, we can force that logic, that particular bit, into what we need it to be so that the rest of the logic will uh, operate. So important that uh, before you force anything, make sure that you notify everyone and you follow the proper procedures. Okay, disabling and bypassing, uh, similar, uh, similar to forcing and is used for more or less the same purposes. Uh, the difference is with disabling and bypassing is that this change is, is done in the field, not in the program. So disabling and bypassing, um, for example, uh, level switch in the field, uh, the contacts aren't working, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You go there and you twist the wires together. Uh, it's, it works. It's not something that you should, that you should do. That's it. That's the end of Control Systems Part 3. Hope you found that very enlightening.